morning and happy Sabbath to each one. Once again, we are together. It's kind of bittersweet for me because we are winding down in our training. Uh, believe it or not, we've got today and then we have one more uh, session together with the amazing disciples training. You can't hear me? Okay, a little adjustment. Is that better? A little bit more volume. Check one, two, great. Okay, we'll try it again. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Good to see each one of you. And for those who are viewing uh, virtually or listening on the audio line, we want to welcome you as well. I want to welcome you from far and near, across the pond, as we say. Uh, and again, uh, for those, of course, here. We also want to let you know that we are winding down in our uh, training. Uh, we have today, and then we have one more session uh, together in the Amazing Disciples uh, training. Again, I hope that you have been learning and being able to put things into practice that we've been sharing here so that uh, your personal evangelism or personal witnessing uh, may be enhanced and uh, most of all that uh, souls will be one for Christ. Uh, how many of you have learned principles uh, as a result of being here? Okay. Um, anything new that jumps out at you that you can think of that uh, you want to even uh, share? And we won't take the time now, but if you want to go to uh, the evangelism website, let me give you that real quick. That's evangelism at ah-cbus or cbus dot org. Again, that's evangelism at ah-cbus dot org. You may have seen some things or heard some things that uh, perhaps uh, intrigued you or that hit a note in you. Uh, we want to hear your comments in regards to that. And if there are things that we could do better, uh, we also welcome that constructive, constructive criticism uh, so that we can do better next time. Without any further ado, let us bow our heads for prayer to invite the Holy Spirit's presence. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a new day. Thank you for a new Sabbath. Thank you for keeping us through uh, this week of toil and labor. And now as we are here together again to once again take part in this evangelism training, we ask and pray that you would enlighten our minds, teach us what is true, guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Ye have not chosen me, but have, I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth what? Bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. That's taken from John 15, verses 5 and 16. We want to move forward in our training. Again, we're winding down. It doesn't mean we've exhausted everything about training uh, in terms of soul winning, but I think we've laid down the key uh, foundational blocks for you to be able to build upon. But we don't just end as we did last week with the gospel presentation, which is a very important part of the uh, outreach or soul winning process. Uh, there is more. You know, you may go to the point or get to the place where your Bible study interests, praise God. Uh, ends up being uh, getting baptized. That's what we want to see. That's the uh, somewhat of the end goal. 
But believe it or not, really much of your work begins at that point. You know, you can uh, bring a baby into the world, you know, you and your spouse, and um, you can just let the baby lay on the table. Is that, is that um, okay? That's a no. <laughs> I heard all the mothers speak up on that. That's an absolute no. You don't just lay them on the table and say, okay, take care of yourself, grow. Uh, eventually, that child will not make it, unfortunately, because it needs what? It needs to be nurtured. It's no different when we're talking about spiritual babes in Christ. We need to be nurturing new believers. You know, they are oftentimes coming out of a world of sin, and regardless of what that background looks like, uh, they're coming into a new space. They're coming into a new family. It's just like a baby arriving in a family, whether you adopt the child or the child is born into the family. Uh, it's new to them. They're trying to get adjusted. What's this place called the world? You know, I was warm in, in my mother's womb all these months, and all of a sudden, you know, this rude awakening. Well, for some who are coming into the faith, it's kind of like that for them. It's almost like a shock, you know. And so it's very important that when we look at this area or this phase uh, of ministry or outreach, nurturing new believers, that we take it very seriously. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being what? Examples to the flock, and that's from 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3. It continues. Conversion like sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Well, excuse me, that's not a continuation of the verse, but the thought. Conversion like the sanctification is the work of a lifetime. The baptistry is not the last step of the Christian experience, but one of the what? One of the first. Why isn't it the, the last part? You know, and that's oftentimes where uh, it, what it makes the difference between a successful evangelistic effort or a successful Bible study is what we do after the baptism. Because we can get excited about, you know, a thousand people came into the church through this evangelistic effort, but there's a thing called a, a proverbial swinging back door. We've all heard of it, no doubt. Uh, it's, it's amazing how the front door gets all the traffic uh, initially, but that back door seems to always continually swing, and before you know it, that thousand drops down to maybe 950, and then next thing you know, it's down to 850, and you ask yourself, well, what's going on? What has happened to all these people? And maybe a year later, you're down to 200 out of that 1,000. That's a pretty poor ratio in terms of, or percentage, that's left from that thousand. And so as a result, we make it very, uh, we make the emphasis on nurturing. Thank God here at Advent Hope we have a nurturing uh, team uh, led by Sister Shirley Benton, who is doing an amazing job with her assistant, Sister Lita and uh, Sister Alberta. Uh, they work very, very dil diligently, excuse me, with their team to make certain that no one falls between the cracks. You know, even regular visitors who are already members of the church, they sometimes fall through the crack. Why? You know, they come and they sit. No one talks to them. No one ever invites them home. You know, it's almost like they don't exist or they're invisible. And so eventually what happens is, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a proven thing that if you, if you notice whether it's an existing member or someone who's new uh, in the faith, if they miss three consecutive Sabbaths and no one has checked on them, there's a good chance they're gone. And so it's vitally important that we uh, treat the nurturing part just as much as the rest. It is essential that the church maintain a meaningful discipleship program 
in which all of the members, new and long time, are encouraged and strengthened in the Christian walk. What's our first calling? The 12 disciples were called to preach, to teach, to heal, and to cast out devils. Does this sound like church uh, pew warmers? Did Jesus say, okay, I'm calling you 12, and I want you guys to sit by the lakeside and just enjoy, you know, the messages, you know, by the seaside? No. He immediately gave them an assignment, gave them something to do, in terms of outreach and, and, and looking after other souls instead of being turned into themselves. Oftentimes, that's what happens is that, you know, people come in and they're either so self-absorbed that they don't think about it. Anybody else think that, hey, I didn't just come in here just to warm a seat or to claim a, a pew or write my name on a pew, but I'm here to also bring others in like myself. Uh, into the work. And so it's very important that we recognize our first calling and do the work that the Lord has called us to do. Again, the most powerful Christians are the ones who, when asked to share their testimony, can share what Christ has been doing in their lives that very week or even that very day. We've emphasized that over and over again, the importance of your personal testimony. It makes no sense for me to go and tell everybody about Sister Shirley's uh, testimony or her, her blessings, and I never have one for myself. You often see it sometimes in, when uh, testimony time comes up. It seems like the same old people, I shouldn't put it that way, the same people give their testimony, and that can be a good thing. It means maybe that the Lord is working constantly in their lives, but others never say anything, and you ask yourself, well, didn't you wake up this morning? Don't you have uh, blood running through your veins? Don't you have a roof over your head? All these things are blessings, and most of all, our gospel testimony, in other words, how we came to Christ or what Christ is doing in our lives is very important. Each member must have a living, vibrant relationship with Christ, rooted and grounded in the spirit of divine love, before we are able to share this joyful experience with others. You can't share something that you don't have for yourself. We talked about it earlier in, in previous uh, training sessions of the importance of us having our own personal relationship with the Lord as well as our own uh, time in Bible study and prayer because as we do this we are strengthened we be become more acquainted with God's word and the principles of God's word so that we can share it with others so it's important that we don't neglect this aspect of our relationship in Christ an irreplaceable role we know the uh, all too well the story of uh, Saul, who became Paul's conversion. And after his experience or his encounter, his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, uh, he was blinded, physically blinded, thrown off of his horse, and he had to be led like a child uh, to, you know, a safe place or what have you. Now, it didn't stop there. The Lord had rebuked him, shown him where he had gone wrong, and basically uh, caused him to do a 180 degree turn in his life. Praise God for that. He accepted Christ, he accepted him as Lord, but did it stop there? No, that was actually the beginning of his real experience because before he could become the Apostle Paul that we know him as become, have become, is, uh, he had to go through a nurturing experience himself. Who did the Lord raise up to to nurture the Apostle Paul. Now, in, in looking in hindsight, can we say that Ananias knows more of God's word than the Apostle Paul? I don't think anyone can say that. When we look at the New Testament, the majority of the 
epistles and books of the New Testament are written by who? The Apostle Paul. Do you see one book by Ananias? Not one. So we should never be intimidated as to who the Lord would bring in our path. It may be someone that, you know, may even be a, a, a theologian, and yet they don't know this message or they don't know Christ for themselves, and the Lord may call any one of us to minister, to nurture to these individuals. We never know who it is that the Lord has in the queue, as we say, and what the Lord will do with that individual. Suppose Ananias had botched his assignment. Pretty serious, huh? Is it any different for us? If the Lord places someone in our path, then it, we don't have to look at it from the standpoint, oh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, modern-day Apostle Paul, it's not that we're always going after the big fish because guess what? The minute you think you caught the big fish, you find out that's not the big fish, and the little fish is the one that's uh, the actual big fish. And so we have to treat everyone as a potential candidate for, the, for, for heaven, first of all, but also uh, a worker for the Lord. And it's up to us in the nurturing process to help them to get to that place and point. Why did Jesus send Ananias to meet, to meet Saul? Couldn't Christ have performed the miracle from heaven since he was the cause of Saul's blindness to begin with? Could he have done it? He could have. He's, he's all powerful. He's sovereign. He could have did anything he wanted. But instead, he chose not angels. He chose us. In this case, he chose Ananias, a fellow sinner. Angels didn't understand what it meant to be born in sin and shaping in iniquity. They don't get that. They just see what goes on, but experiencing it for themselves, they hadn't gone through that experience. So when we look at God's kingdom, it was a book years ago that was entitled uh, The Upside Down Kingdom, something to that nature. When you look at a lot of the things in terms of how the Lord uses uh, or, or, or works in his church on behalf of his people, it seems almost uh, backwards. You know, why would you choose a bunch of fishermen, uh, a thief, a uh, tax collector who was embezzling money, and a, a couple of hot-headed brothers to do this work? It makes no sense. But God chooses extraordinary, let me put it that way, means of getting his work done. And so he has called us to be co-laborers with him in the process. And what's interesting is as we nurture uh, new believers or people who are new in the faith, they become nurtured, but we also are being nurtured. They grow and we also grow. It's a dynamic that we can't put down on paper and say it makes sense, but it's the Lord's method of uh, purifying our characters as well as to strengthen those who are new in the faith. Acts of the Apostles, page 122. When in the midst of his blind error and prejudice, Saul was given a revelation of, of the Christ whom he was persecuting, he was placed in direct communi communication with the church, which is the what? The light of the world. The Lord has placed us or he has raised his church in this sin-darkened world for us to be lights. Now, when you're walking down a, let's say, a dark alley or a dark road, how important is the light? Very important. Without the light, you'll be groping or we'd be groping in the dark, correct? Bumping into this, bumping into that. But God has placed us in the world as lights to uh, show the way we're, uh, to Christ, and so we have to take that role very seriously. It continues. In the case, Ananias represents, in this case, excuse me, Ananias represents Christ. 
and also represents Christ's ministers upon the earth who are appointed to act in his stead. In whose stead? In Christ's stead. In Christ's stead, Ananias touches the eyes of Saul that they may receive sight. So we may not necessarily be called to give someone physical sight, but for certainly all of us are called to give uh, people spiritual sight. Uh, and that comes through by the way of sharing the gospel and, of course, in this phase that we're talking about in the nurturing process. It continues, in Christ's stead, he places his hands upon him and he prays in Christ's name. Saul receives the Holy Ghost. All is done in the name and by the authority of who? So we don't go off and, you know, do things and, or try to do things in our own strength or to gain glory to ourselves. We remember, um, um, trying to think of the person in, in Acts who who wanted the Holy Holy Spirit or wanted the Holy Ghost because he thought it was some, you know, magical power that he could have and do things. What happened to him? Didn't go too well, did it? Simon Magus, thank you. Didn't go well for Simon, did it? He got kind of whooped up on, I do believe. It continues, all is done in the name and by the authority of Christ. Christ is the fountain, the church, is the channel of communication. So we are in essence God's eyes or Christ's eyes here on earth. We are his hands. We are his voice. We are his feet to carry the gospel uh, to those who are perishing. So Christ isn't physically walking on the earth right now uh, ministering as he did some 2,000 years ago, but he has raised up uh, children to uh, carry the gospel to the world with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Remember that when just when Christ was about to leave the disciples, he prayed for the Holy Spirit and he said that he will not leave you, leave them comfortless. And that goes all the way to our time or to the close of time that the Holy Spirit will be uh, here in Christ. There. The difference between Christ's uh, physical limitations as a man on earth is that the Holy Spirit doesn't have those limitations. He can be in and with each and every one of us uh, leading us in, in our work. What does it mean to shepherd the flock? This is taken out of 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4. And if you've been uh, listening and studying the uh, Acts of the Apostles, we've been in the book uh, 1 Peter. And this verse uh, should... Uh, jog or, or at least come back to your mind. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by what? So should we, I have to twist Brother Corey's arm and say, come on, let's go and minister. No, he should willingly because he cares for people, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to us. You know, there are people who they may, quote, uh, enter into the nurturing process, but what they oftentimes will do is they lord it over that person that maybe has been assigned to them. You know, they, they want to micromanage their growth in Christ. They're ready, to, the, the uh, interest or the new believer is ready to take off, and because their demeanor is to keep things slow and just move slowly. They want to, uh, to, uh, to do the same uh, with that individual. So we're not to lord it over people or, or come at people with a heavy hand to try to whip them into shape. Uh, it's a process that uh, we all have been through our, and are currently going through and growing in Christ. What does it mean to shepherd the flock? But being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd, who's the chief shepherd? When the chief shepherd Christ appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. The family of Christ. We talked earlier about gardening and what that entails. Uh, Christ often used 
gardening and farm, agriculture, along with fishing and different things to illustrate points. As we look at the family of Christ, we uh, again want to look at spiritual gardening in this instance. Notice the following quote. After individuals have been converted to the truth, they need to be looked after. The zeal of many ministers seems to fail as soon as a measure of success attends the efforts. If you've ever been a part of any evangelistic effort uh, long enough or uh, enough times, you will see cases like this where the evangelists, and it's interesting, praise God for evangelists. They have their calling. And if you notice in the breakdown of spiritual gifts, uh, you have evangelists and you also have pastors. Now, in some rare cases, you have both in one person, but that's very rare. And you'll find that evangelists, they're the type, you know, it's almost like being in the military. They can go one place, do what they have to do, and they get the next calling and go to the next. They don't really take the time to, you know, look after the sheep and and see how they're doing. Yeah, on, on, uh, a, a good evangelist will time to time call back to uh, the, the host pastor and say, how are, how are the folks doing? And they may remember certain uh, people who, you know, they work with during the evangelistic effort, and they say, you know, I know such and such was struggling. How are they doing now? That's all in place. But there's a difference between that and a person who's a pastor or a pastoral role that we all can share. And I don't mean that we're called as all called as pastors, but the, the work of actually nurturing, that's what pastoring uh, has to do uh, much with. Uh, it's all something that we are called to do. Again, I'm not saying all of us are called to be gospel ministers or ordained ministers, but we are called to look after the flock. We continue. They do not realize that these newly converted ones need nursing, watchful attention, help, and encouragement. These should not be left alone a prey of Satan's most powerful temptations. I've seen it so many times, and I can say we probably all experienced it, is that when you have a new believer, they come in and they're zealous and they're excited about their newfound faith and their, their new uh, found relationship with Christ, and they want to tell the world. You want to harness that energy. You know, you don't want to let that, that fire die because if you look around, there's too many people who don't even have a fire anymore, let alone, uh, you know, a, a, a flicker going. So when you have someone like this, you want to harness it. And this is a very critical time for them because what oftentimes happens or can happen is that if they're not nurtured or if they're not directed right or even connected with the right person to help them to grow, they got families, they got old friends, they got spouses, they got children, they got parents back there who don't agree with the decision they've made. And so they can make life very difficult for them and even to the point where they can put a guilt trip on them and make them feel like they've made the wrong choice. Look, you're at that church and nobody calls you. They don't invite you out or anything. And so they begin to think in their minds or the devil begins to play on their minds and say, you know what? They're right. Nobody's ever invited me home for dinner. They don't even talk to me. It's like I'm a statue in the church. They just walk by and, you know, blow the pigeons off. No, we should see these individuals as uh, people that God wants to grow in, in Christ. Again, you don't bring a newborn baby home and lay it uh, in the crib and walk away and say, hey, feed yourself and change your own diaper. Uh, hey, it's smelling in here. Ain't you changed your diaper yet? No. We have to get in there and nurture that baby and anything that is alive and that is nurtured will grow. That's just a, a law, a fixed law that God has put out there. Whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, whether it's, whether it's a human being, 
If you nurture it and take care of it, it will grow if it's a healthy uh, child or person. They need to be educated in regard to their duties to be kindly dealt with. How should they be dealt with? Kindly. kindly. So, you know, don't appoint yourself as the, as the, the, uh, the church police. You know, someone come in and not, not quite right as you think they should be, and you pull out your measuring tape and all these other things, instruments of war that you bring. Uh, keep them at home and deal kindly with people. To be led along and to be visited and prayed with. You know, if you never take the time to stop by and see someone and check on them, uh, it shows or it sends a message to them that you really don't care. Now, you can happy Sabbath all you want, but if they never hear anything else from you, then it's questionable. Matthew tells us, what is promised to the new believers who have left all for Christ? How can the local church family be a partial fulfillment of this promise? God promises to grow his church if we do our part. Spiritual newborns, cute little fella there. You know, in the last uh, six months, we've added two new grandbabies, and uh, it's funny. My youngest son, he's getting a crash course, <laughs> and the oldest son, he's uh, he's you know four four kids in now, so he's he's pretty well adapted. That first one is always a challenge. You, you don't know what you're doing. You, oh, you, you're ready to pull your hair out. You don't get any sleep. All these things, but you know what? You stick with it, and you get through it. And with each child that comes after that, that stress level goes down, and you say, you know what? I got this. I can handle this. Why? Because you're experienced at it. It's the same thing in terms of uh, raising or nurturing newborn Christians. This may be your first go round, your first time really getting involved in uh, spiritual outreach and giving Bible studies and bringing someone along uh, in the Lord. And so don't panic, don't freak out, you'll get through it by the grace of God. And the difference here is that you have the aid of the Holy Spirit to help you through it. Spiritual gifts. Let's turn quickly, if we could, to 1 Corinthians 12. And we want to look at the spiritual gifts as is given to us in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. And as soon as I get there, I'm right here. Okay. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And then we jump to verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. And finally, verse 11, but all these worketh the one, that one, and the same self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Who gives the gifts? The Holy Spirit gives the gifts, not you, not me. You know, we don't go around and say, Brother Brian, this is your gift. I know it. The Lord told me. 
Well, hospitality might not be Brian's gift, but you've told him it is. Can't the Holy Spirit speak to Brian? Like he speaks to all of us? Now, it doesn't mean that we may, the Lord may uh, show us just by being around people, those uh, gifts, you know, they start to come out. Uh, and then you recognize that, hey, this is something that, you know, you might want to look at. And oftentimes when we do come to someone and say, hey, have you ever thought of doing this? And, you know, it ends up becoming a confirmation to them that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, leading them. So uh, there is some interaction together, but we do need to recognize where and who the gift comes from. Oh, let me back up. <clears throat> Why are spiritual, spiritual gifts given to God's people? Who decides what spiritual gifts we receive? It's important that we allow people to develop into certain gifts. Um, for one, the Bible warns us in Timothy about uh, laying hands suddenly on anyone to become a deacon or elder. Well, that's in a, you know, more in the realm of, of administration and help, so to speak, in terms of the church setting. And so certain gifts have to be developed over time before you put someone, you don't want to put someone in a position where they end up becoming prideful uh, or even overwhelmed and then end up uh, falling or turning away. Is the role of one person more important than that of another? I think we all agree there. How can we encourage new believers to recognize the importance of their gifts and to utilize them in ministry? We're going back to the toolbox. The Lord has definite tools for us in this area as well. Let's consider the following. What are some things that a spiritual mentor should do? Because as nurturers, we are actually mentors. We are mentoring someone. That's why, you know, often you'll see where a buddy system, so to speak, is developed where, you know, in our case, we have the uh, nurture team uh, along with the pastor and, and, and nurturing leaders will help assign a person uh, to a new believer. Why is that so important? Uh, and it's good that we all have an interest, but some personalities don't go together. Now, you can force a, 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 a round peg into a square hole all you want, but it isn't designed to fit. And if you force it, you may end up causing damage. So it's important that... Uh, the, the church works along with the members to help uh, place people with the, or connect people with the right individuals to help each person grow. Number one, get to know new members and genuinely befriend them. Is that hard to do? Not at all. Two, greet new members at every church service and program and invite them to stay for fellowship dinner at the church or at your home. How many of you have ever gone out of town somewhere, gone to a church you may be unfamiliar with, and, you know, because of the fact that you're staying in a hotel, you really can't make accommodations for a Sabbath dinner, and you sit in that church, you know, you folks greet you if they greet you, and you just kind of hang around waiting, uh, hoping that somebody will invite you home for Sabbath dinner. You pace back and forth, you talk to different ones, and it never happens. Everybody gets in their car and go home, got plenty of food at the house for you and your family and your cousins, and they won't invite you home. That's a travesty. That is sad. That should never be said of us. You know, my wife and I, especially when we used to live, you know, closer, we would always make it a point, my wife uh, would always make extra food because we just never know who was going to be at church. And if you make that a practice, you know, don't worry about how modest your home and all is. Uh, let me tell you, 
Back in the day when we used to live in the little matchbox of a farmhouse, we would still bring people up to the house. As long as your house is clean and the Holy Spirit abides there, that can be an oasis for people to come and be refreshed. And so never think, oh, I have to have a palace before people will come out. No, you just have to have the Spirit of God in you and be able to uh, show uh, hospitality. And let's face it, unless you uh, invite someone over and, 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 and uh, share, you never know if that's your gift or not. I think it's very sad that, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there are some people who have never asked someone to come to their house. Never. Oh, you might say, oh, well, I'm not a great cook and I can't do this. No. Hey, nowadays you can cater. Get a few people together who can cook, but just host it at your house. By doing so, you're just simply saying, I care. Number three, implement a spiritual guardianship plan with pastors and elders. We talked a little bit about that. It's important to include the pastor and elders or whoever the leaders, and again, in our case, we have the nurture team leaders, because they typically know the congregation. They know, you know, who uh, are the police of the church, they know those who are always backbiting, talking about the pastor, talking about the church, you know, disgruntled. You know, basically glump, the glump of the church. And that's how they carry themselves. So you don't absolutely not do you want to put a new believer with that, that person. Now that's one home that doesn't need to have hospitality because they're going to mess it up. But for those who are spiritually mature, who are grounded in the faith, who aren't off into some weird theories about their faith and whatnot, those are the ones and who have a pleasant uh, disposition about them, uh, those are the ones who should be connected. Number four, look for ways to involve new members in church programs and activities. This, again, is very important. Just like when Jesus called the disciples, the 12 disciples, apostles, he put them to work right away. If you don't put someone to work, for one, they're going to feel unwanted. Oh, I have talents, but nobody recognizes them. Now, if you try to put them to work and they say, you know, I'm not quite ready now, don't give up on them. Just give them a little bit at a time. You know, one or the uh, the, 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 the ways that oftentimes people are introduced into working is ask them to serve as an, uh, uh, as an usher or a greeter or to give calls to, you know, encourage the elderly or something. Just something small, and then when they get their, their spiritual legs under them, then you can give them more because, for one, you'll be able to assess what they can do and how well they do it. Number five, introduce new members to established members of the church. We've talked about that. Speak positively of the church, pastor, conference, et cetera. Et cetera. You know, one of the things that Ellen White talks about uh, uh, quite a bit is that we need to be very careful what we say around our children, our family members, and non-believers. Because we could be working counter to the Holy Spirit by our negativity and the things that we say. You know, if, if your children constantly hear, oh, past is this and the past is that and, and so and so. And every time you go to church, there's drama. You know, all, and that's all they hear. What are they going to think about the church? You think they're going to stay with the church? So it's important that we... Always speak positively. Number seven, encourage new believers in the faith. Apply. What does it mean to apply? Here are five sample activities you can utilize to disciple new believers. Number one, make regular phone calls or schedule personal visits. It doesn't take much to make a phone call. 
If you cut down on the gossip time, you have time to make some positive calls. I'm just teasing you there. No, I'm not. <laughs> Spend time and take the time to call people. I remember years ago, I learned a bitter, bitter experience, uh, lesson, excuse me. Um, I had been working through the week and just a very tiresome week, just we just physically and mentally wore out. And um, I think it was like a two-week stretch. And it was probably about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. You know, I was just so exhausted, I just kind of plopped in the bed. And my wife and I are laying there, and the phone rings. And um, she said, um, it's your friend uh, James. Now, James and I, we grew up together, and, um, you know, he was in my wedding, you know, a whole bit. And uh, he called, and uh, he said he wouldn't talk to me. And, and I told my wife, I said, you know, can you ask him uh, if I can call him back? I was just so tired. And um, so she, she asked James and, uh, if I could call him back. He said, oh, yeah, sure. And um, I didn't call him back the next day. Thursday morning, I got a call from my sister. Said that James had committed suicide. I can't tell you the, the guilt that put on my brain. You know, he was reaching out because he knew I had given my life to the Lord and was walking with the Lord, and he was probably reaching out for someone to be able to counsel with or to, you know, just encourage him, and I was too tired. Yeah, it's, you could say it's a legitimate excuse, but that was a painful lesson to learn. So we want to take time. but It doesn't take much to, uh, as they say, reach out and touch someone with a phone call and personal visits. Invite new members home for Sabbath dinner once a month. Include other members who may have things in common with the new members. Why do we want to do that? You know, if you invite someone home, which is good, that's the first step, but, you know, they don't feel like they can relate to anyone, it makes it harder, especially if the, the person is shy. Uh, those you got to work a little bit more to, you know, encourage them and strengthen them. Uh, so if you have someone who maybe has similar interests, they can strike up a conversation. You know, while you're in the kitchen warming up things, they can be, you know, uh, making the person feel welcome. Uh, and then by also inviting other members to be there, uh, they also get to, you know, know the congregation, learn people. And when you're in church, it's a little hard to do that, especially if you're tight schedule or people are shuffling out. And some people... If you notice, you know, they kind of come to church with their head down, they find their seat, they go through the service, and out the door they go with their head down. They don't really want to make eye contact. They don't want to engage people, but they also need to be engaged. This will help the new member become acquainted with more people in the church. Number three, during the week, invite the new member to meet you for lunch or at a local restaurant. So this doesn't just, nurturing doesn't just take place on Sabbath. You know, what, what, what a gesture for someone just call you out of the blue and say, hey, let's do lunch. You doing anything tomorrow afternoon? You know, let's, let's go here. Or you can invite the person to be your walking partner or something. You know how much witnessing or nurturing you can do walking or jogging? So think outside of the box of just Sabbath. Uh, you know, take the person out to dinner. Take their family out to dinner. And um, oftentimes that brings down a lot of barriers so that you can uh, befriend the person. Do social activities together. If you're planning a day of recreation, Include your new members. Train yourself to think in terms of including them, new members in all of these activities. I have this thing locked in my brain that if I'm at church and I see someone new coming in, my eye is on them to, at some point, if the opportunity allows, to be able to welcome them, to engage them. You know, 
it doesn't take much when, you know, we're having song service, uh, or excuse me, having the hymn, and you see that this new believer doesn't have a song sheet or, or have a hymnal. Just simply either hand them yours or share yours. That's simple. That's not hard to do. If a Bible text is being uh, read uh, and they don't have a Bible, does it take much to open your Bible and just do this? It just simply says, I care. Sit with your new member friends in church at fellowship meals and at other church functions. We've all seen it. You know, the group that loves each other, they all get together in their corner of whatever the fellowship hall or, or, or whatever the venue, and they talk among each other, each other, they laugh and they enjoy each other's company, and you got this new believer or this newcomer sitting off to themselves. You, you see them, they get their tray and they're walking and they're trying to see well, who looks friendly that I can go sit next to. First of all, it's hard to find a seat because you done took all the seats up. Just simply invite, if you see them looking around like that, just say, hey, come on over. If you got to move your chair or give up your chair, it's better for you to go sit with somebody and you can be more familiar with because you're already part of the church family versus somebody who's coming. It's kind of like anybody ever had the first day of school? We all have. You go to school, especially if you're transferring to a new school. Nothing worse than to walk in and all eyes turn on you. And you feel like, okay, let me find the seat in the back, in the corner, and you slip around. That should not be the case when people come to the house of God. They should feel welcome. They should feel like, oh, wow, you know, this is a great place to be. I remember when my wife and I uh, first moved to, Col to the Columbus area, and, you know, we, we were looking for a church home, and uh, we went to a particular church. I will not name the church. And um, went there, and, you know, after service, you know, you kind of go out in the lobby, whatever. Nobody talked to us. Nobody reached their hand out to shake our hand. It was like we never came. And we said, well, maybe this was just, we caught them on the off side. So we came back the next week. Same thing. And the bad part about it, my old roommate from college was there. We greeted each other, but did you, you think he said, hey, man, come on over the house for dinner? Mm -mm. So me and my wife got in our little car and went home. The following Sabbath, we decided to try another church, which was very friendly, warm, and as a result, not that that's the criteria that you go by for joining a church, but it does make a difference. It made us want to be there. That's the main point I'm trying to make. A simple yet vital part of being a spiritual mentor is to introduce new members to other church members. For instance, you can simply say to the new member, I want you to meet so-and-so. You know, they're not going to know that person. Now, if they're a friendly person, outgoing person, they'll say, hey, hi, I'm so-and-so. But most times that's not going to happen. You have to be proactive and recognize and, and introduce them. That's how they get to know the different members, or one of the ways. Say to the established member, John, have you met? such and such, so you can do it in the reverse. Either you take the person to meet someone, or you can say, hey, John, have you met? You know, he's standing right next to you, and you can do, a lot of times what people do is sit there, they'll talk among each other and never introduce the person standing next to them. For one, it's rude, but it also shows that you don't really care. Turning to the new member, saying something interesting, such as John runs a contracting company in town, to get the conversation going. So you basically share a little bit about the person so that they can feel uh, or they can be able to, con to connect with someone. So if you know that John is a contractor or, or Susie is, you know, whatever, you can 
seek out someone who maybe have that background and say, hey, did you know, uh, I want you to uh, meet uh, John. He's just moved into the area or he's just, you know, been newly baptized and he does this. You don't have to go into all of it. It's Sabbath, so you're not going to engage too much of that, but at least it gets the conversation going. What's our weekly challenge? This week, invite a new believer and his or her family to your house for a meal. Be intentional about also including a second church family who has similar interests as the new believer. We talked about that a little bit earlier. But something as simple as just having a meal. You know, when people are invited to come and to, to dine, whether it's... Uh, at your home or elsewhere, people tend to get, become more relaxed and they feel like, oh, wow, you know, I, I feel at home here. I feel at home with this person. Uh, and you will be amazed at you, what you begin to learn about the person. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I, uh, you guys hear me talk about Sam so much, you know, we've just been great friends through the years. Uh, if you notice, Sam will, will take someone under his wing, and if it's every week that person's coming to, to his house, they're going to come to his house. If Sam is going somewhere else, to eat, he said, well, you know what? My sidekick's coming with me, you know, whatever. I use that term. That's nurturing. That's bringing a person along so that they can begin to... Uh, become a part of the family versus feeling like an outsider. Find out what the new believer's spiritual gifts are and look for ways to utilize these strengths in the church, helping the new believer become involved in a local church ministry. So again, that's the goal, is to get every member working. Not everybody has to be teaching or everybody has to be leading something, but every member should be working some way in some ministry. If it's nothing more than doing a, a, a bread baking ministry or, or, or sending out cards or, you know, making telephone calls and have a prayer, uh, you know, time with people. You're doing something, you become involved, or the person becomes involved and feels like they have a part to play, that they have something to, to do. You know, if, would it be all right for me to cut uh, each one of your uh, big toes off? One big toe? No takers? Not one. Virtual? Anybody? Of course not. That's one toe that's important to you. I remember in high school we had a on the basketball team there was a guy he uh, he was born without a big toe and he was a you know good play ball ball player and what have you but he walked with a steady dip and the guy could run just as you know fast as anyone but he had that steady dip why because he needed that toe for balance. You'd be amazed at how important that big toe is. The Lord gave us that big toe for a reason, as well as the other toes. But that helps to give you balance so that you're not, you know, walking with this constant dip. Spiritually speaking, God likens the church to the body. Every portion of the body is important. You can take out an artery if you want to. You'll have some problems. Try one eye, it's better to have two. Take out that tongue, won't be so much talking. All these things are important. Moving on, learn the art of loving men to Christ. We are drawn towards those who love us, and when the most callous feel that man loves us, they are drawn to you at once, and as you are nearer to the Savior, they are. The quote continues. You are drawing them in the right direction. You cannot look after God's people and properly care for them in all their sins, temptations, trials, and difficulties unless you do what? Unless you love them. That concludes it. <laughs> we have one minute to spare. We want to thank you so much.